This is uh, Fessa Pliqueta. This is Joe Cole. This is Ruben off the cheek and you're listening to the London, London Blue, Blue Podcast. Podcast. All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London Is Blue Podcast. As always, your host, Brandon, joined by my co-host, Nick and Dan. Gentlemen, welcome back. Insert joke about you not being here midweek. Glad to have you, Nick. This joke won't cease to escape me. Cool. Really cool. I'm glad we've started telling jokes on the show. It's it's about time. We're long we're long due. I thought you said you were the funniest though. Oh, well yeah, by far and away the funniest. When, when Brighton leads in with a joke though, it typically Well, <clears throat> don't worry. We've got backup because listeners, international break is here, but we're still putting out the content. So you might be wondering, what are you guys going to talk about today? Just kidding, you've seen the title. Surprise is blown, Phil. Chelsea Youth is here. Welcome back, sir. It's been a while, but we have good reason that it's been a while. Hey, guys. Really good to be back, actually. Yeah, it's been an unusual few months in the academy scene. There was quite a long time without any football to talk about at all, but that's changed a lot in the last few weeks, and there's doubtless plenty to talk about. I promise I won't tell any jokes, though. <laughs> they will They will undoubtedly be funnier than ours, though. So, you know, that's that's really the other reason why we bring you in, because you're... Big facts. The wonderful wit. <laughs> My side hustle as a comedian. I love it. Um, let, let me get that link, bro. I'll uh, I'll pay for that stream. I'd love to see it. Uh, hey, listeners, what we're going to be talking about today uh, is going to talk about a lot of key loanee updates. Uh, it kind of seems to be where a lot of the football from the academy is being played right now since we did have a break, which we'll talk about. Uh, we'll discuss the performance of the U23s and review how the U18s are getting on. So pretty standard as you would expect, obviously, uh, whenever whenever we bring at Chelsea Youth on. And again, if you haven't, go follow. Give him the follow on social media. But judging by his follower account, you probably already are. Uh, but before we get into it, just want to say some quick thank yous, right? Derek, Josh, both joining uh, with an upgrade and a Patreon yearly sub. Look, the King's Road newsletter from Joe Tweeds is out. These things are are academic papers okay their sizes sources are cited he has a bibliographies page i mean this thing is mint and i highly suggest you you check it out it's worth five dollars to test it see if you like it you can read all the previous ones you remember when you committed to reading more books throughout the year and and it was going to be a part of your annual goals absolutely skip the books but stay yep. with this newsletter because by the end of a month you would have read 900 or, or a thousand pages so mm -hmm. you know what, we actually should just get lists on goodreads because it should count for that uh, i also think that Joe probably has never met a word count that he is completely bypassed. No, nope. he likes to he likes to wave at the word counts as they pass him by, you know, and it's <laughs> there they go. They're gone. <laughs> very, very true. Uh, Dan, you do have an Apple podcast review. Yeah. Dante at our Lancers leaving a wonderful five star review. It was just the word noise. And so uh, that was good. I really appreciate that. Uh, so that's wonderful. Hey, leave some more Apple podcast reviews, five stars, and we'll drop you a little love in the next podcast. Actually, leave graphic. the word noise. If, you, if you're if you listening to this and you're like, damn, I haven't done that yet, just leave the word noise so we know that you know. All right. A uh, okay. little bit of housekeeping. I'll just jump right into this while Brandon types feverishly. Uh, Joe Tweed says, uh, in addition to producing about five million words a week for the for the newsletter – which has been great. He has uh, gone about his own uh, version of, of a podcast, which we are really excited about. Uh, it's called the King's Road Podcast. Uh, it's going to be produced underneath our uh, our feed, so you won't have to go anywhere else for it. So it'll just pop up in your London is Blue feed this week. Uh, we are really excited for this. We've been talking to Joe about this for a long time. And to see it come to fruition and to see our editor, Jake, absolutely put in the, the hours to make this thing sound incredible uh, has been a real joy. So I don't know, Brandon, thoughts and feelings on, on Joe's first efforts here? I think it is hilarious that we're talking to Phil today. Phil, do you know who Joe's first uh, guest was for his episode hmm. series? I do hmm. not. Hmm. All right. It's, <laughs> this, this is going to be fun. But uh, look, this is much more of a, a long form, right? Narrative series. It's not 
reactionary. Um, it's going to be really cool. He's he, Joe is going to go dig into a lot of different topics. Uh, all you have to do is listen to the first three minutes, and he kind of gives you a synopsis of what's going forward. Uh, but really excited that for that to drop this week. So, um, look, international break, but we don't care, Nick. We are putting out the content. Oh, you're getting a ton of Chelsea youth today. You're getting Joe. And unnamed guests for, for the for the first episode of, of his show. And then we have, you know, basically next Saturday until the, what the last part of May is absolutely incredibly nonstop for Chelsea Football Club. I mean, there are women's matches. There are youth matches. There There is a men's calendar that is getting more jam packed the further we go in all these different competitions. So. Uh, we have the West Brom match review coming at you next next weekend and the following Monday. So we're going to be back on the two or three a week uh, nonsense that we've been doing all year. So get ready because April is going to fly. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into some of the loanies that we had talked about at the, at the top of the show in the running order. Uh, first one up, uh, I think probably top of most people's list right now is Mark Gurhey. Stock still on the rise, question mark. Dan with the leading question. So, Phil, you had a loan update in February, and, and you had a nice little quote in there. It says, while Gerhi defends superbly and drives progressive play from defense for promo- promotion chasing Swansea City, how is it going for young Mark over in Wales? It's it's going really well. Uh, we are already chasing a place in the Premier League, and whether they get promoted or not, it seems clear that Mark will play top-flight football next season whether it's in England or somewhere else in Europe. But the question is whether that will be as a Chelsea player at Stamford Bridge, a Chelsea player on loan, or on a permanent departure. Liam Toomey, our good friend from The Athletic, did a long piece with Mark this week where it was intimated that there may be a move in the pipeline this summer akin to the way that Nathan Ake left when he joined Bournemouth with uh, a sizable fee Chelsea have the protection of uh, an additional year's option to trigger on his current contracts they're not going to lose him for for pennies but the idea that he would leave with a buyback rather than trying to get himself into another loan cycle that's not any it's it's maybe a little bit more than speculation right now but it's it's an interesting thing to consider as we look forward with the changing face of Chelsea's defence. There's a lot of senior defenders who have interesting contract situations coming up. We've got Aspilicueta, we've got Rudiger, Zuma, Christensen. They're all approaching some sort of crossroads. And when you factor in Gerhi and the Kyo Tomori into the picture, and whether Thiago Silva renews for a year, there aren't enough spaces for all the players who A, want to play and be good enough to play. And Mark might not be of that very top tier standard right now. He's playing for Swansea tomorrow. He's playing on loan for Milan. You can see that there are levels still to scale, but there's nothing to say that given 12 to 18 to 24 months that Mark couldn't be of the right caliber. It's whether he now wants to wait to do that or go off somewhere else, prove himself quicker and see where his career takes him. Is this the new model of the two year loan, the buy with a reasonable or the, the sell with a reasonable buyback clause? It could be. It's always an idea that I think is spoken of as really being enticing for all parties. But the thing that's rarely spoken about is that the player needs to have a reason to want to come back. And it's it happens so rarely, um, especially in England. I think people look at the way that Real Madrid have done it over the years and um, they tend to flip, flip those players for profit eventually. The, the few of them end up saying Danny Carvajal is probably the best example of labor that they've done it with. Um, you've seen that they've had players on loan at Arsenal instead of selling with a, with the right to buy in return rather than um, pursuing the old way of doing it. Hmm. The, every time that you end up uh, putting one of those deals out, you have to really find a way to encourage that player to come back. And if they wanted to leave in the first place, has enough changed for them to want to come back? And two years the line, you go here this summer, you've got a buyback. Two years' time, you might have invested in the market again, and there's there's no room, and you've still got the same marginal call. When there was talk about Ake coming back from Bard, people were still uncertain as to where 
that he was uh, for the team positionally in terms of ability. He's on to Manchester City, he suffered through injuries. He's playing a high enough standard that you can make a case that he would have been fine for Chelsea. But it wasn't a slam dunk of a decision. And that's always the problem when you have these uh, options to buy back. What would you say is the biggest step up in his game that's occurred this season from last season? For those who don't maybe watch him and don't have the point of reference to say you know, how he's improved or why he's on this trajectory. It's it's the confidence and authority he now plays with. When he first went into Swansea in January of 2020, he had a, a bit of a rude awakening. It, the speed of the game seemed to surprise him a little bit and he was making a few mistakes and he actually lost his place in the team. Steve Cooper took him out of the firing line for a bit, let him settle down. And then the, there was a three-month hiatus through the early days of the pandemic. And when he came back, things started to click for him and there was a bit of a change of formation. He was able to play on the left side of a defensive back three, which is a particular role. It's, it's very different to playing in a back four, as we all know. And he got into a groove and then you can start to see the personality come out in him and the way he's able to to drive their progressive play from the back. He's an excellent passer off either foot. A lot of people will mistake him for being left footed. He isn't, but he can play so comfortably off that side that it's, it's, it's John Terry-esque in a way. Terry was never left footed, but you could easily look at him and think he was. And as he's cemented his place in the team, he's then playing for England under 21s as one of the senior important players. And it, Swansea start to do well and that breeds confidence and he takes his game to the next level. The question mark I have about this, and it's not a, it's no knock on Mark, it's the same question for a lot of players, is that he hasn't played professional football in front of a sizable crowd since the early days at Swansea, save for the League Cup appearances he made for Chelsea in Lampard's first season. He played against Manchester United and did excellently. But there's a big question about how these younger players react when stadiums are full again. Interesting. Okay. Um, can we can we move to another promising center back? And, and that's for Kyo Tamori, who's having himself an incredible experience on loan at Milan. Uh, what What is, I mean, what's the deal here? I, I think you have a lot of Chelsea fans, Phil, who are, who are really confused about, you know, the, the for Kyo to, to AC Milan move, why that happens, uh, especially given the back three setup that Chelsea are playing now in the first team. It would have seemed a little tailor made for him to to fill that left center back spot. So, uh, can you maybe shed some light on on this move and and kind of how it might play out over the next few months? Oh, from Fikayo's perspective, the move made sense because his sudden disappearance from the the picture at Chelsea made no sense to us, and from his account, it made no sense to him. He's spoken quite openly about it just before moving, just after moving to Milan. Sorry, and he said he was really none the wiser as to why it happened. It didn't feel like it was a decision that made sense and that's something that I think a lot of Chelsea fans agree with we've only heard one side of the story I'm sure that if Frank was to be open and to talk about what happened he'd have his side we can only respect what's out there in, in the public domain but it was clear that he was he had options to move at the end of the summer window that didn't happen didn't play very much until the January window and then you explore your options. And if an offer comes on the table from Milan, you're going to take it because, yep. fine, they may be only Europa League, but they were top of Serie A at the time. And it's a fantastic platform for him to reassert himself, to play at Chelsea, to play at Milan, to play somewhere else and to play for England again. And he's shown his quality since he's gone out there. And we now have to wait and see whether Milan are going to exercise their option to buy, which is 25 million euros plus 5 million in clauses. The general sentiment when he moved is that nobody expected this deal to actually happen. That Milan were going to be unable to afford it or unwilling to pay it. And it's part of doing loan business with Serie A teams that they have to be seen to have some sort of option. Otherwise, it's a wasted investment. But the longer this goes on and the more that Milan talk about him, you have to think, well, maybe there's an option here. And then you factor into what we were talking about with Gerhi. What does Chelsea's centre-half depth chart look like for next season? Is Thiago Silva getting a renewal? Is Rudiger getting a renewal? Will Aspilicueta get another one-year contract? Who's coming in? Who's coming out? And if you're Fikayo and you're settled in Milan and you're playing well, as long as Milan want to take that, uh, can afford to pay for him, then he might as well be happy be staying out there, which would be a great disappointment because we know what he's capable of. That Serie A table is pretty wild right now too. Like from an outsider that doesn't follow Italian football, 
Inter Milan, 65 points on 27 played. AC Milan. Isn't it Pipo Inzaghi? Or no, who's the head coach there? It is Stefano, Stefano Pioli. Ah. He posed at Benevento. So you got 28 matches played, 59 points. Juventus, 27 matches played with Pirlo in charge, uh, 55 points. So there's a bit of a bit of a gap already, you know, six points uh, with the game in hand for Inter, but AC in second. You know, it's all about the Champions League money in Italy. We know that they've never been the highest paying, le- you know, um, um, league. So we'll have to see. I mean, and Milan are probably looking to shoot up enough to, like you said, to get that outside investment and kind of balance the books. It sounds like they're hurting. Yeah, I think the Champions League qualification is something that will drive whether or not they have a realistic chance of signing tomorrow. If they don't qualify for it, they, they won't have the budget to. But it looks like they will, even though they've fallen away since the, the new year and Inter have... They've got the best depth in the league. They've got the best squad in the league. They've probably got the best manager in the league. And um, and I say that as somebody who wasn't Antonio Conte's biggest fan, but I respect the manager. Fair. And yep. in Inter were favourites for the league for a reason, and they're showing why now. But Milan have improved several levels over the last few years. Uh, they just don't have the depth to compete on all fronts. They suffered uh, a few injuries, and that's why Fikayo got an earlier opportunity than many expected. All right, so a final question between uh, Gurhi and Tamori. If if Chelsea could only have one of them uh, return and, and feature, uh, which is a completely made-up scenario that I'm doing right now for you, Phil, um, which one would, would you prefer and, and why? That is a terrible question for me to ask. I know. Shane Solomon hand. Oh, like that's not, that's not cool. I know. I know. I, th- I, I think know, I know what I just said. Yeah, right. Phil's like, from a sell Rudiger, sell not Christensen, sell <laughs> everyone else. Bring in the boys. You knew that he's going to flip this on you. It's got to be an academy squad only. No, <laughs> it, it being the primitive to take what Fikayo has done at higher levels and say, well, he's proven that he's capable of playing Premier League football, Serie A football, international football, and to do that, he's fairly young age. is is very impressive. Mark hasn't played top flight football yet. And from that purely pragmatic perspective, you take Tamori and take your chances with Gohi leaving and seeing what happens. But I think Gohi's the better technician of the two. I think Fikaru is the better athlete of the two. And that's not to knock any of their other attributes in and around that. If you merge the two of them together, they'd be almost the perfect centre-half. They just lack the idea of height. Uh, player combination, combinations should be the next thing we research to figure out how to <laughs> master the creation of the ideal footballer. But... One other player, uh, as we kind of continue forward in our loan conversations, Connor Gallagher, who's had a, a bit of a active loan season in his time at West Brom. Uh, your update uh, from the Chelsea Loan Army update that you did, Phil, was that Gallagher is one of the first names in Sam Allardyce's West Brom team sheet in their renewal uh, renewed battle to avoid relegation and is a high-end ball winner on the stats front. So I will just let you espouse the wonders of young Connor Gallagher. Yeah, I think that he didn't lose his place in the team under Allardyce, which was something a lot of people, myself included, were worried about. And even if he did lose his place, Allardyce has a reputation for being something of a long specialist, and we didn't want the ball just to be pinging over Connor's head all of the time. Now, he is a high-end ball winner on the stats front. He wins, his tackle success rate is similar to that of the Premier League leaders, the likes of Angolo Kante and Wilfred Ndidi. The caveat of that is the West Brom don't have possession very often by comparison, which means he has more opportunities to win the ball. What it does show is that he has the capacity to be a highly effective presser and ball winner in the right setup. Again, if this was Frank Lampard's Chelsea, for right or wrong, you might think more favourably of Gerhi and Gallagher getting a chance to play for Chelsea next season. Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea may not be quite early on to somebody like Gallagher, if only for the reasons he's given for why Billy Gilmore hasn't been playing so regularly. If he's going to be playing this 3-4-3 formation with two central midfielders and you have Kante, Jorginho and Kovacic, you have to be exceptional, his words, to get into that rotation. And we know that Billy Gilmore has had some exceptional performances and has an exceptional future. But in the grand scheme of things, he's fourth in that hierarchy for a reason. If a guy comes, is he fourth, is he, where does he fit? And it might be that he needs another year out on loan. It might be that he takes this 
exit route with a buyback clause or without one. Because if he projects to be in that rotation, he would be the source of player and Golo Kante is. He's a ball winner. He can drive the play, he can press the play, and he can contribute a little bit in attacking areas. Uh, he's he's not really had the capacity to show what he's capable of on an old point of view as Brom because of how they play. We saw in the championship at Charlton and then at Swansea that he's capable of playing as a number 10 and being busy in and around the edge of the opposition penalty area. And maybe that's what we need from another loan from him is to play in a team that enjoys more possession and a more attacking output to see how effective he can be in that area between the two penalty boxes because in his youth career and then in the championship there were few players who showed the engine to be able to affect the game from start to finish in that area of the pitch and it's it's not something everybody's got so I'd like to see him given a chance at Chelsea it just might not be this summer for the for the reasons that Tuchel has gone on uh, record as talking about with Gilmore. It's almost like a little social experiment for us watching is it better to go on loan and play or is it better to stay and get minutes on the training pitch with with the manager between Gilmore and and Conor. Yeah, it's, it's something we've had for a long time, right up until Lampard took over as manager, because we had players excelling out on. Like we can go back as far as Nathaniel Chalaba, who was doing things that Gallagher was doing in the Championship, but a decade earlier as a seventeen-year-old, he was outstanding. But at some point, there has to be a breakthrough, an opportunity to see them at Chelsea in the first team. We had eight or nine of them make their debuts under Lampard. And you could have had question marks about every one of them, from Mayan to Tamaran, to Fikaya to Mori, to Amanda Broja, to Tino Andrin, every one of them. Are they ready for this? And it's only through giving them the opportunities to play and then to stay that you really find out whether they can or not. Otherwise, the questions will always be there, even when they leave. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, moving on to Ruben Loftus-Cheek. Saying that name has made me realize just how long it's been since we've really talked about RLC, which also makes me sad. But uh, again, pulling from the February loan update, Ruben, he's racking up the minutes this season. Uh, obviously, Fulham are giving it their all, trying to get out of this relegation <laughs> battle. I mean, they are really trying, unlike some teams at the bottom. Uh, and it looks like he's just past 1,600 minutes, maybe more by the time we're recording now, Phil. Uh, and it looks like the most he got was uh, 1,965 at Palace and then 1,956 that he got surprisingly under Maurizio. Sorry, I didn't realize he got that many minutes. Yeah, there were a lot um, of them in the Europa League run that season. The, hey, Premier, League, the Premier League football wasn't as... Uh, as, as much as it was at Palace, but that Europa League run was really important and it helped him break out into the player that he finished that season being. So the extra rounds that normally we complain about, Ruben is like, yeah, add on the Europa League rounds. Let's go. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the Europa League get, is much maligned for obvious reasons. It isn't the Champions League, but when you are a club of Chelsea's stature and you have players on the fringes of the squad from the academy, it's a perfect competition to get them up to speed and to play regularly in. Well, it's it's interesting too, Phil, right? Because uh, I I saw the stat pack that came out yesterday uh, from Manny on Twitter, and he said that in eighteen nineteen uh, he had fifteen goals and assists and seventeen starts, which was a goal or assist every one hundred and thirty minutes, right? Which is I don't know, like it seems really good. Yeah. <laughs> now, now the level of competition maybe impacting those impacting those stats a little bit, and he was able to maybe bounce players from Slavia Prague off of him a little more easy than he would uh, someone from West Ham. But at the end of the day, I mean, his, his complete form is still something impressive. I think the question is, will he ever get back to that? Whether he gets back to it or not, I don't think is necessarily the question for me. It's whether it happens at Chelsea because mm -hmm. he's now 25 years old and figures to come back into an even busier depth chart if he if it was to be in this formation at Chelsea and we, we have to presume that Thomas Tuchel has only played this formation so far at Chelsea he may be more flexible in future but let's assume that it's 3-4-3 he'll be in the front three Fulham have tended to use him a little deeper in a central midfield role which is why some of his attacking numbers aren't quite there for the same reasons that Gallagher Fulham don't necessarily enjoy as much possession play a highly transitional game um, and they've done very well with it since the mid-season point um, and you'd think that that would favour Loftus-Cheek, but they don't do it in the numbers that would allow him to get forward. 
if he was to come back at Chelsea, he'd be competing in that front three with Hakim Ziyech or um, or Kai Havertz or any of those. He, he could potentially play as the false nine that Havertz has been doing. I don't think it's a role that suits him because you want him on the ball uh, and driving into space. But if if Tammy Abraham has struggled to get in the match day 20, admittedly with injury, in a very congested attacking group, Loftus-Cheek has just as many challenges to face. And if he's 25 and off the back of injuries that may have taken away what he did best, you then have to question whether it's an opportunity for Chelsea to explore the market to cash in on him. And then that comes, we bring into the fact we're in a, a pandemic and clubs don't have as much money. They haven't had fans in stadiums for God knows how long. And if you are selling him, you're probably selling him at below market value. But does he want to go on loan again? He's probably had too much of that life now for somebody in the mid 20s trying to recapture their best form. And it, it is a really big question mark as to what happens with him this summer. But as optimistic as I'd like to be for all of these boys, Loftus Cheek is probably the one that I have the most doubts about finding a place back in this squad just because of the number of attacking signings that have been made since he was injured. Hmm. Ugh, but but he's, he's such a, an enticing sort of prospect because there isn't anybody who can do what he does when he's on the sort of form that he finished that Europa League winning season with. It's just this easy on the eye, smooth, powerful, destructive running from attacking midfield into attacking areas. Really good finisher for a player of his size and build and you don't tend to see it happen so often and it's an asset that you have in-house that just needs a little bit more return to form return to fitness and to be used in the right way and again if you can find a way to assimilate him without sort of cutting off your nose to spite your face losing out somebody else loses out so the Ruben can come back in then it's a win-win but it's a really hard picture to to piece together can we um can we quickly transition to Armando Brosha, who is uh, apparently just uh, on one? Uh, as, as this will be more Mary uplifting, Phil. Nick. This will yeah. be a, this will take us You're, out of the dumps. <laughs> you ripped you ripped my heart out, so now let's put it back in. Um, can, let, let's let's talk about Brosha, who is who's been on a tear. Phil, what, what are your what are your thoughts on him? What are your thoughts on his loan spell, and what is the path forward for him to, to potentially come back to Chelsea at some point? He's been fascinating. We've spoken about him on this podcast quite a few times because he went from, uh, I wouldn't say an afterthought, but he had a very quiet start to his under-18 career by any standards and has recently gone on record for saying that it was through playing for Albania at under-19 level than under-21 level in that season between turning 17 and turning 18 that gave him the confidence didn't come back at Chelsea, gave him the platform to score all of those goals in the 1920 season, made his first team debut at the end of and now he's gone off to Vitesse, scored a bunch of goals, which he is the most prolific teenage scorer in Europe. And that takes some doing. It's it's an interesting thing because when you watch him play, he doesn't wow you and isn't necessarily involved in a lot of the play, but he's very effective with what he does. He runs the channels particularly well. He does it hard. He does it with effort. And because he's got this big frame and plays with the aggression of that frame now, he's such a great release valve for pressure. You can just play the ball up to him and he'll hold it up. He'll use it well. And then he'll get himself into a position to do something in the box. And the area is a brilliant, a brilliant platform for him to take his game to that next level. There's considerable interest in him back in England from championship level clubs. There'll be interest from him, higher level Dutch clubs and similar uh, across Europe. I'd be surprised if he wasn't looking towards the championship for next season. Um, it's There's 46 games minimum there. It's, it's a really, uh, we've seen that players from the championship can go into the Premier League, can go into Chelsea and uh, and hit the ground running. So he might be a little way off yet in terms of a Chelsea future, but he continues to meet the challenges and and to impress. And very shortly, as we record this, he starts for Albania against England in the World Cup qualifying. So, Nervous, hmm. Phil? Yeah, Phil. It's, <laughs> it's a great opportunity for him to to remind people of what he can do. It's not an easy thing for Albania to come to, to, to play against England. Sorry, I was going to say to uh, Wesley, but it's in Albania. It's not easy for him to impress against... Uh, uh, 
one of the the better international teams in the world but it is a stage for him to say right well i've met every challenge so far let's see what happens now well, it'll be good to see what he can add to his highlight reel. And uh, look, we, we don't have a dog in the fight. So we just like to see Chelsea players do well in international duties that don't involve the U.S. men's team. Uh, so best of luck. Uh, hope he does well enough, but doesn't hurt the England qualifying efforts. Um, but Phil, grab bag time. So we, we picked a couple that we were interested in. Uh, I know there's maybe a few... Uh, Trev Chalba, Jamie Cumming, Nathan Baxter, by Bakayoko, you put a couple in here that you wanted to grab bag on. So I will just cede the floor to you and let you wax poetic or just give the right type of update to let the listeners know exactly what these individuals have been doing on loan. Yep, cool. Let's run through them quickly. Trevor Chalba has done really well in France playing for Lorient, who were promoted into the top flight last summer. Uh, relegation candidates than they still are but he he played remember for Huddersfield and for Ipswich in a similar defensive midfield role with the last two seasons in England he's done the same there mostly for Lorient they have moved him around a little bit but he's he spent most of his time protecting the back four and doing it very very well he wins the ball back he clears it he's capable of getting it and using it and playing with more personality and more confidence with each and every week which is a struggle um, sorry it's, it's something that a lot of young players struggle with to go from playing as a youth player into a senior player and moving around a lot on loan. You have to feel comfortable in that environment and going abroad for the first time during a pandemic. It involves growing up and okay, sometimes you might not be able to come back to the UK to see your family. You, you are there. That club becomes your family for a little while. And I think it's, it's a move that's really benefited him. Again, whether it's the Chelsea future or not, I think he's positioned himself well for his next move and has proven that he can play in a top European league to a pretty good standard. The two goalkeepers, Jamie Cumming and Nathan Baxter, are playing in England's third and fourth tiers. Baxter is at Accrington Stanley and Jamie Cumming's in his first load at Stevenage, following the same sort of journey that Baxter has done over the last few years. Jamie recently had a run of six consecutive clean sheets um, down at Stevenage. Almost seven, because in the seventh game he conceded in the first game and then didn't concede after that. And... He um, he spoke to Adam Newsom from Football London recently and gave credit to the whole team's defensive performance, um, saying he didn't have a lot of work to do, which is uh, a very magnanimous thing to say. But it's also very impressive that he's been able to put together a season of 3,000 plus minutes, prove that he can play in the professional pyramid as a young goalkeeper. He's, I think he's still only 21 which is very, it makes him one of the youngest starters in the Football League and gives him an opportunity to move up to League One next season, which is where Baxter's been playing. And Baxter was helping Accrington to sort of an unlikely promotion push. We've also got Tarek Uwakwa and Jonathan Russell on line there, but Baxter was the one who was standing out until he got injured a few weeks ago with a shoulder injury that looks set to end his season, just as it did last year when he was on loan in Scotland at Ross County. It's the different shoulder this time. And he said if they make the playoffs, he may be back for that. But I think for all intents and purposes, he's done for the year, which is really disappointing because, again, he's done very well in England third tier, looking for a championship loan next year and may still get one because his body of work speaks for itself. But for a young goalkeeper to have missed the end of seasons or significant chunks of seasons because of shoulder injuries to both sides now just adds a little question mark. And hopefully that doesn't affect him too much for the long term. Do, do we think there's going to be, based upon, and this might excite Brandon Busby, uh, with the development of these young goalkeepers here at Chelsea, next three seasons? Maybe there's one actually challenging for the top spot in the Chelsea lineup? I think both the, first the, the right track to position themselves to be in the squad at some point and then it's about where we get the opportunity to play they've both spoken about how England's goalkeepers Nick Pope and Jordan Pickford and Dean Henderson have all been on the same journey that they've been on at roughly the same ages in Baxter's case he's ahead of them in senior games played that doesn't necessarily mean anything but it all goes well for the sort of progress they're making and when Baxter signed a new contract a couple of years ago he said that by the time he's 24 Kepa's initial contract will have potentially come to an end and obviously we're in a different situation with Kepa now but he was ambitious enough to talk about himself as a potential first team goalkeeper which is something that everyone else sort of saying well let's see where we go but Baxter's got the confidence in himself he was the one to the club as a 17 year old and say I don't want to play academy football I want to go on loan into the men's game to to help myself on that journey 
It'd be I nice to see because it's of, of everything else that we've had the the youngsters coming into the first team fold over the last few years. The goalkeepers have always been that little bit a step behind. Even when Jamal Blackman, and Mitchell Beeney were serving as the third goalkeeper, you never sensed that they were going to get into a position to play. A hey, credit to Nathan Bax. He's six three. He's still growing, and he's he's getting big. He's finally putting on the weight now that he's old enough to to get to that that point. You know, which is important. Man, I just. Can't believe he didn't talk about uh, Keppa's upcoming extension, though. It seemed a little short-sighted as well. Uh, well we we Jamie... had to get some goalkeeper chat in here for you, Brandon, <laughs> but we'll, we'll try to focus on the academy boys. Yeah, you think Jamie coming six foot two? You know, he's starting to get bigger too, bulking out. But you know, it, you, you have to see. I mean, look, they can you can make a career sub six four as a goalkeeper. Obviously, it's not as easy, but. Um, definitely potential. It's a confidence game to hear these that these two feel like they are on a path of development is the most important thing. As long as they believe in the journey and the process, and and they know that they're preparing themselves to get to a certain level to be rewarded with an opportunity, I'm all about that. I kind of like that. Um, you've got two more low knees that we should talk about. Yeah, and neither of them are academy boys, but I just thought that one of them was interesting and one of them deserves a bit of credit because he's been much maligned by me over the years. Um, we'll start with him, Kennedy. Kennedy's done quite well for Granada this season in a bunch of roles. They're in the last eight of the Europa League now, I think, and he's been productive with his opportunities. He's very still quite limited as to what he does. He runs, he shoots, he's got a really good shot on him. But credit where it's due, he's done really well, played more minutes this season than just about anywhere he has on loan previously from Chelsea. And fine, he doesn't have a Chelsea future. Let's say that. But he's done well enough that he'll get a nice move and he's done enough that Chelsea might get a decent return for him now. And the more interesting one um, is Tiamo Bakayoko who continues to play at a high level for Napoli. All of his loans have been at clubs that Chelsea would happily buy a quality player from. He struggled here in his first season in England. We know that. In the right team and in the right structure at Chelsea, and we know we know that Thomas Tuchel is very big on structure, he has proven that he is a highly capable ball winner and is very comfortable playing under pressure. He's an asset we know that there are plenty Phil, of central midfielders. What are you trying to say, <laughs> Phil? I... If you read the loan report, you know what he's going to say. <laughs> oh man! Is there a place for him at Chelsea in this crowded midfield with everything else that we've already discussed? He arguably is the most talented that have our loan in terms of career prospects, international experience, played at the highest levels in the Champions League. Watching what happens to him next is going to be interesting. Tuchel has said he wanted a little extra height in the team. So, I don't know. Maybe he'll be looking at it. Um, wow. Flash from the past. Didn't think we we're going to go that far back, but I'm sure glad we did. Hey, we're going to take a real quick ad break. When we get back, we're all, we still got to touch on the U23s and 18s. We Usually, that's all we talk about. But uh, this was a fun little uh, carousel around the loan report. So, appreciate that, Phil. Thanks, these sponsors, for supporting the show financially. Um, when we get back, it's going to be more about the Academy. Here we go. Hey everyone, before we get started, I wanted to tell you about Blue Wire Hustle, a brand new program where you can host your very own podcast here at Blue Wire. Hustle was created to give everyone the opportunity to take your podcast to the next level. Or if you want to host a podcast and just don't know where to start, Hustle is the perfect place for you. As part of the program, you'll receive personal cover art, Q&As with Blue Wire's top podcasters, <clears throat> really hope that's us, and access to our community Discord, an e-learning course full of tips and tricks. And on top of that, will help you get your show pushed out to Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, and all of the other listening platforms. And the best part is you can get all of this for only $15 a month, the same rate as any other hosting site would charge you just for the initial setup. So whether you're starting from scratch or have an existing show that you want to grow, Hustle is an open door to leveling up your sports podcasting experience. Acceptance into the program is limited, so get your application in today to apply go to bwhustle.com forward slash join. Check out the description box of this episode to find out more, but that's bwhustle.com forward slash join. Come hang out with us. We love Blue Wire. You won't be disappointed. All right, Nick, bring us home to Cobham, sir. Yeah, look, I, I mean, 
as we said earlier, the, the season's been kind of stop start um, due to COVID and all the necessary uh, structure that's been put in from the government level, Phil. So can we run through kind of where Chelsea are at in the U23 table? You know, I'll kind of list that off really quick and then maybe some of the challenges that they've faced this season. So, you know, to tee us up. We have City on 41 points. We have Blackburn Rovers on 36 points. Tottenham Hotspur on 32. Derby County on 30. And Chelsea in fifth on 29 points. Only one point ahead of United in sixth. And Liverpool, or two points out of Liverpool in seventh. That's a, it, it's a weird table given how, uh, how prolific this U23 team has been in the past, Phil. So maybe can you talk about kind of their challenges this season and, and what their prospects are moving forward? It's been a pretty challenging season. They have a game in hand right now, and if they win that, they would move into third place behind Manchester City and Blackburn. It's important to point out that Manchester City are having a record-breaking season. They've still got five games to go, and they've already broken the goal-scoring record for this level since this format came about. They've been unbelievably prolific and just been demolishing pretty much anybody not called Chelsea. Um, Chelsea played them home and away and drew two all on both occasions. And we'll come back to that when we talk about the under-18s and their, and their <laughs> FA Youth Cup prospects. Blackburn have been a little bit more experienced and had some first-team players and some older development players in the squad, and they kept that group together and have done really well. The rest of the league has just been prone to the interrupting interrupted calendar, the COVID protocols, so many postponements. Chelsea didn't play a game between the 18th of December and the 5th of February. And they didn't play a home game between the 18th of December and the 19th of February. So they went a long time without any formal competitive football. They lost players to injury in that time. There was so stop start. I think they had limits on how often they could train as a group during the, the height of the, the, the worst wave of the pandemic in England. And they've only won once since they came back from Christmas. And that was a fortnight or so ago at home to Everton. But they've only lost twice. They've just had a lot of draws. And in some of those draws, they've just lacked a little bit of luck. So they drew Nuno with Brighton. They hit the woodwork three times. They drew at Leicester. They hit the woodwork there. They they, they beat Everton, but they hit the woodwork twice in that game. And there's been it's, it's a coalescence of a lot of factors that have just left them a little bit short of where they were last season when they won the league unbeaten. Um, after 18 of 22 games when the league was put on hold and called at that point on points per game. They've they've been one of the better teams in the league, as we can see. They're, they're fifth. They'll be third if they win the game in hand, which is away to West Ham. It was meant to be on Good Friday. It's now after that because of the Youth Cup. And they've got every chance of finishing second if they finish well, third if they don't, which will be a, a respectable season for some of the stuff that they've gone through. It's just when the standards have been set as high as they have over the years, as soon as there's a drop-off from it, and this happens with the under-18s in particular this season, it leads to people questioning, well, why has that happened? And it's understandable. Chelsea set themselves very high standards, but it doesn't mean that they've gotten any worse. All right. Well, even though the the standards have uh, not dropped in the performance, maybe has been a, a little different and challenged. Uh, you know, I think there are some players that we should dive into uh, there's a good list at the U23 level, but I think the one that has garnered the most attention and conversation and might have the best name in the Chelsea ranks at the moment, but Tino Livermento is one that I think we always like to talk about, Phil. What would you say about how his season's continuing to progress? He's He's been really good. He's played more minutes than anybody else in the development squad. He's mostly played as a right wing back. He's had a couple of get left side, which people have been very interested in. But he's he's done all most of his work on the right. He's affected the play. He's got a bunch of assists. He scored a few goals, and he he tilts the field in that way. It's it, you'll have the ball go through George McEachern or Lewis Bay or Billy Gilmore in the defensive midfield roles. They they're inclined to play it out to the right hand side where Livramento goes. Everybody gets drawn over, and then his delivery is typically good enough that somebody's going to be able to come onto it in the box for a first time finish or for a link up play. It's a different type of crossing to somebody like Reese James. Reese has got a, he's got a great whip on his delivery, and he puts it in a pace. Tino tends to put the ball in low along the ground, perfectly weighted for somebody to arrive onto. Might be easier done at under twenty three level than it is in the first team, but it's it's a weapon that will be really interesting to see how he transitions. 
there's some sort of there's elements of his play that reminds of what Dujon Sterling was able to do when he was a teenager in the youth team and then in the development squad and causing mayhem up and down the right hand side. Dujon's actually done really well himself in the last few weeks. He he missed the best part of a year through illness and injury and personal reasons. Hasn't gone out on loan, has come back to play as the right sided centre half and against Manchester City as the centre half in a back four, which is completely new to him at this level. And he kept Liam Delap quiet, which very few people have done this year. But Livermento has done well enough that people have said, well, can we get him in the first team? Can we get him a debut? And you've got Reese James. We had Tarek Lamptey, who's gone on to do great things at Brighton. Livermento seems to be the next one in line. And it's an exciting time to be producing players of that, just almost as a conveyor belt because of the way the academy sets up and likes to play their football. But he's certainly at the stage where he'll be looking at his options for next season. He has to be playing men's football, whether it's at Chelsea or more likely he'll be somewhere on loan. Another another point we have is Tierno Bayo, or do you call it Ballo? It's Ballo. I always get made fun of, Phil, for my pronunciations here. So I'm the one who gets made fun of for pronunciations all the time. All right, never mind. Dan can hold that one. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, again, I'm just gonna, you know, float over to you on, on this one. Again, one of the significant minute makers, Austrian attacker. I mean, what, where, where do you want to go with this guy? He's, he's been very productive in the last few weeks and made his Austria under 21 debut this weekend, um, with a hat trick, um, against Saudi Arabia. They won 10 nil, so it was a very favorable match for them, but he scored a first half hat trick and it was a nice introduction to him at that level and keeps his good form and productivity going. I've always felt that there's a, a very loose comparison. I'm very wary of making comparisons because people run away with them, but he does remind me in some ways of Sadio Mane in that he plays in the same sorts of positions and the same sorts of roles and he's very efficient with what he does. And sometimes what he does doesn't look like it should work, but it does. And he, the measure, the measure rules in Chelsea's handbook make him one of the smallest and lightest players at the club, but he doesn't play like that. And again, he's he's been very highly touted for a long time. And whether or not he goes on loan now or middle of next season, we'll have to wait and see. He's very experienced for his age at the club already. He always seems to affect the game in the final third: goals, assists, productivity, link-up play, pressing. He's got a lot of the the right rounded skills to to enjoy a very productive career and he's approaching that point where you ask okay what what's the next challenge for him it's not going to be a first team opportunity at chelsea just because we know that there's such a high bar and a considerable depth chart ahead of him in the attacking positions but he's good enough to go somewhere and be and pretty impressive off the bat, whether it's Holland, whether it's Austria itself, whether it's Germany, who knows. But he, he seems to find a way to be productive and he's versatile enough, not just in that front three. He's in these youth team days and in some of the friendlies that 23 has played this year. He drops in and plays as a as a six or an eight in central midfield. There's a lot to like about him. Six goals, four assists and 17 matches. Again, really strong, uh, you know, from a results standpoint. Um I, I love a Sadio Mane comparison for obvious reasons. Um, but you just think of that where, you know, he can play out wide or probably in that like attacking front three with a a fluid kind of attacking front three. Is that what you're saying? He can essentially exactly play that, across yeah. the, the attacking spectrum. Exactly that. He's done that throughout his time at Chelsea. He's dropped into midfield a bit, but mostly you, you can play him as a nine. You can play him as a false nine. You can play him as one of the, the two narrow attackers in a narrow three four three or wide in a wider three four three or in any other combination of play. He's, he's very, very versatile and seems to do well in almost all of those areas when he plays. As, does, we, uh, um, as does Marcel Lewis, actually. Um, great transition. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, when you think of Ballo, you tend to think of Lewis because they, they've their, their careers have dovetailed at Chelsea and they've been in the same teams and they complement each other very well, even though they are quite similar. Marcel's even shorter. He's a bit stockier and doesn't really play as a nine, but he does a lot of the same things as Ballo. He's he's maybe the best pressing forward that the, the club have. He takes the right angles. He's got the right energy for it, the right stamina. He disrupts play. And then when he gets it, he's an effective dribbler. He can play off either foot. He's able to score and create. He's very good from dead balls. And there, there's a real good player in there. 
the question with him is that he's out of contract this summer and there is speculation that he's going to decline the opportunity to extend and to seek his fortune somewhere else, which is a decision that plenty have come before him have made and the majority of them have gone on to do very well. And whoever ends up getting Lewis, if he does leave Chelsea, will be getting a very, very good young footballer. Hmm. If he doesn't, it's... Uh, He'll be into the loan army and whoever gets him on loan will be getting a very good young, young footballer. Obviously, we hope that he does extend his stay, but we've been here before. All right. Um, Miles, Miles Pert Harris. Yeah, has been injured a little bit, um, has recently returned and played for the under 18s just for some minutes while the development squad don't have games during the international break. But again, he's been productive and He's, he's matured his play over the course of the season. He can play as a central midfielder. He can play in attacking areas. He's got that same sort of vibe that Tino Andrian and Ruben Loftus-Cheek have in that they've got the powerful presence, but the technical ability and the goal-scoring instincts in, in key areas. He links well. He's starting to learn to play with his back to the opposition, to receive, to play off, to move again and go. Um He's younger than most of these guys. He's in the youth cup team again for this season, whereas Ballo and Lewis and um, some of the other attackers in the development squad are a year further on. So he's he's making the same sort of progress as some of his predecessors in that position. And I'd, I'd expect him to still be in the mainstay of the development squad for the first half of next season. If he finishes the end of this season fit again as part of a youth cup campaign, it'll be a nice way to finish. And I think the sky could be the limit for him because... He makes everything look easy. And so the challenge with him, as it has been for similar players before, is to keep extending those challenges and seeing where he goes with them. All right, last one again. I think people have forgotten, but there's some interesting names on this this squad, right? So Danny Drinkwater's still here. Bubba Rockman's still here. Billy Gilmore. Uh, and Petter Cech. I'd be remiss not to say that. But again, they're at the lower part of this team. They're involved, but not really playing much right phil yeah there's been the odd player who's come in and played a few minutes here and there. drink water and baba ramen were they weren't a part of lampard's plans and the club didn't find uh, a move for them in the extended win uh, summer window so you've got to do right by them and give them some opportunities to play uh, they did well enough in the development squad although their fortunes when they the team's fortunes when they did play didn't seem as favourable. It wasn't anything to do with either of their performances. It was just a, a coincidence. They've both now found their moves and the development squad looks like it should look. It gives the opportunities for the young developing players at the club to play rather than just respecting the older professionals who can't find a move. Czech was a very unique circumstance. He played one mm -hmm. match. Um, I don't expect that to be repeated anytime soon. They've taken a look at a couple of trialists again recently because it's that time of year. Players are on the move. You're exploring what you can do in the market, in a post-Brexit market, and who you can and cannot sign, especially at younger ages where the criteria to sign them is uh, at times going to be impossible. Um, so everyone's trying their best to find a little edge in the market. Yeah, we will not forget that uh, match Petr Cech played. Um, it against, was probably the match of the season, yeah, against Tottenham, Tottenham with the this the double red card. Uh, oh, it was exciting, absolutely exciting. Um, all right, Dan, back back to you. Sorry for distracting about Petr Cech. Uh, That's okay. You know, I, I know you're like a you know a dog to a water hydrant, right? The moment you see Petr Cech listen anything, that's what you're going to go to. That's what you want to talk about. Um, so. Phil, just kind of rounding out, like what's what's a reasonable goal or what's what should be the aspirational goal for this Chelsea U23 side by the end of the season, knowing they're up against a Manchester City side that is record breaking at this level? City are going to win the title. Um, they're, they're not going to be stopped at this point. Blackburn are close enough, but I don't think they have the quality to overtake them. Chelsea finishing third should be the minimum aim. They're within reach of it. And they've they've shown they 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 got to go to Tottenham, so that would be a match that basically decides that they could overtake Blackburn. They do have to play them home and away still, so mm. second place would be possible. And we know that they aim high, so if they can finish second to Man City, I think that would be a a, a very respectable outcome for the sort of season that they've had. Understanding that City have had to smash a bunch of records to get to the position that they're in, and more credit to them, they've got a fantastic generation of players there. It's been it's been a very 
tricky season for everybody in the academy. And if the development squad could finish second, it would show that they've bounced back really well. All right, so we're transitioning from U23s to U18s. Uh, another interesting table, Phil, to look at, given yeah. Chelsea's usual dominance here. And, and this is something we want to get into because it's it kind of shocks you when you look at it. Uh, the South table in the U18 division, uh, Fulham on 38 points, uh, top of the top of the table. Crystal Palace on th- on 38 as well, but with a worse goal differential. Brighton Hove Albion on 36. Uh, Villa on 32, Tottenham Hotspur on 30 with a better goal differential than Chelsea in sixth on 30 points with a plus 11 goal diff. That just that just shocks you to read, doesn't it, Phil? Like that's not typically where Chelsea are at this point. Of the yeah, season. exactly. When we spoke earlier about people's expectations being high because of the success the academy has experienced, it's typically been the under-18s who've been successful. They won this South table in the under-18 division five years in a row. They had five youth cups. They've won the domestic title at this level numerous times, UEFA Youth Leagues. And so any time they fall even slightly away from the top, people have their doubts. And if you find themselves in upper mid-table, then I wouldn't say people start to panic about it, but they start to write off players. And it's it's so premature. And it's every, every year and every season, every intake of players is different. And then when you're working through mm-hmm. a pandemic, it's even harder. And especially in the South table and the teams uh, above Chelsea. Last summer was the last time that these clubs were able to recruit aggressively before Brexit happened. Chelsea are no strangers to doing that themselves. Um, But Fulham, Brighton and Villa in particular have all been very aggressive on that front. They've gotten themselves a bunch of attacking options. You can see that they they all score freely. Fulham have scored uh, a rate of just about three a game. Crystal Palace are a little bit of an outlier because this is their first season at this standard of Category 1 academy football. Mm. But they do have a a generation that they rate extremely highly. They they beat Chelsea in an under-15 competition, um, a very high-level under-15 competition a couple of years ago with this generation of players and mark themselves out as a group to watch. Um, Tottenham have been as strong as Chelsea for a long time in some of the younger age groups. They had a very handsome win at Chelsea a few weeks ago in a, a match that didn't go Chelsea's way for several reasons. Tottenham were very experienced, Chelsea less so, but just Chelsea didn't play well. And I always come back to that, that for all the success that they've had and for how, how ambitious you want to be as an academy, you have no birthright to being successful just because you have been and there will be down years. The reason those years and that yep. success is so special is because it's rare. And the challenge for these boys now is they're on a, a different development curve. Some of them we've already seen, Jude Sunsup Bell and Harvey Vale, uh, move up to the development squad as first years at the age of 16. Harvey played for the first team in preseason as a 16-year-old. Uh, there's there's undoubted talent in there. This team has been younger as the season's gone on for a, a, a bunch of reasons. A bunch of the schoolboys who are in their full-time education program have been playing because since early January until... This week, in some cases, younger age groups haven't been able to play. If you were under 16 and you were training with the under 18s, you were able to continue doing so. But you've got to get minutes into the likes of Leo Castledine and Lewis Hall and Ronnie Stutter and Brody Hughes, these schoolboys who are going to be scholars next season. You've got to give them minutes while trying to juggle everything else going on around you with the pandemic, the unavailability of players at short notice, the moving of the schedule. Chelsea, again, this was a group that didn't play a match in a month either side of Christmas. They only played a couple in February and now they've played six in March with a Youth Cup tie at the end of this week, which leads into another busy April. There's there's mitigating circumstances and they'd be the first to tell you that there have been performances that they weren't happy with and things that they do again but it's not just a simple case of saying look Chelsea are sixth in the table and eight points off the top of the league because that's not how it works um they can finish the season well they they play teams uh, uh they've got Aston Villa left they've got Fulham left they've got home and away against Arsenal and they've got Tottenham um they're all big local derbies except for the Villa match and Again, like the 23s, if they can finish the season with a good run in the league, push themselves up a couple of places, and then we can talk about the Youth Cup, it would be a positive spin to the end of a, a tough season. 
I, I'm always fascinated by these youth tables. Um, and I know it's the South Conference and North Conference, all these different things, but it's like every time we talk, Phil, I feel like there's a new surprise, you know, in these tables. And <laughs> when you talk about just the context around the season for the youth, and nothing's ever straightforward. Players it really isn't. Up. It's, you're dealing with teenagers, young teenagers in some cases. And so you'd look at, somebody would look at that table and Southampton being rock bottom with one win from their season so far. And oh, don't Southampton have a productive academy? They, they're, they're meant to be one of the best in the country. And to some degree, they still are. But what that con- table doesn't give you the context of is how young Southampton have gone at times this season. They've had under 16s, they've under uh, under 15s playing. And it's, it's that context that, I try to bring to to attention sometimes because otherwise people go into uh, into these conversations and talk about the academies with just a, a straight statistical record in mind and it's never that simple. So Phil, one of the other things I think that's interesting here is this is the one table in which Brighton is actually converting probably at or above their expected goal <laughs> yeah. um, versus the actual men's or first team that they 50 have. Goals uh, for. I know their, their academy... Yeah, their academy has been, I think, a highlight. And I've seen a couple articles come out where uh, are, are they following a Chelsea sim- a model similar to Chelsea? Because I know that they're getting some recognition similar to the way our academy Yeah, has. they've they used Premier League money over the last few years to build a really expansive and smart network of scouting and loan development. Uh, particularly through South America and in the unexplored markets throughout Europe. They signed a couple of quality Polish players in um, and brought them in in January. They've got a couple, of, uh, one from Ecuador or Colombia, I think. And uh, even someone like Robert Sanchez, they signed from Spain a few years ago. He's just got his first senior international call up, um, having spent some time out on loan and then got the trust to to come into the first team this season when people would have otherwise been safer and stuck with the experienced goalkeepers. Um, they they run a really good operation. They've got some good scouts. They know their market. And it's every time a club like that comes along, establishes themselves in the Premier League and does things right at all levels, it makes life a little bit harder for Chelsea at academy level because now you've got another rival in the same region trying to get the same players as you, not just at home, but from abroad. And it's a challenge that everybody welcomes because iron sharpens iron. You want to be... At the top, you're going to have to meet these challenges and you're going to have to uh, make yourself better each and every day. And uh, Chelsea will still be doing that. It's just that the South the South League has become far more competitive in the last couple of years than it perhaps ever was. And that's with somebody like Arsenal having a bit of a down cycle. If Arsenal um, realised the, 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 the changes they've been going through over the last few years, they've had a complete restructuring with their academy scouting department. They brought Per Mertesacker in as their head of academy. They brought in some high-level coaches at the younger age groups. All of that's going to lift them up and they'll have a renaissance at some point. Cool. All right. So want to want to feature a couple of, of players here, Phil, just to kind of wrap up the U18 picture, because we know maybe the results haven't gone as well as, as the team would have hoped. But uh, let's talk about Edwin Anderson. Uh, first goal for the U18s yesterday. Uh, this was not a player that we featured on the on the last update. So maybe just a little bit of a profile on him, Phil, and, and you know, kind of what his potential might be moving forward. Okay, um, he came from IFK Gothenburg in the summer. It was a deal that had been arranged roughly a year earlier. And he's had to endure the same sort of challenges as a lot of people over the last year. He wasn't able to sign his scholarship in the country. He had to do it remotely through COVID protocols. And then you're trying to settle into a new country in your first season here with all manner of restrictions. And so he's he's been a little bit of a bit part player. He's a wide forward at his best off the left coming on to his right. His dad once compared him in style to Callum hudson Odoi, which you're playing with fire when you do that, but you can see why he would do so. Uh, at his peak, he does have some of the same hallmarks of the way he plays. Um, his first competitive goal came yesterday. It was a nice, easy one teed up for him. It was a rebound off the crossbar that, from Joe Haig. He did score a couple of really nice goals in an in-house friendly um, a few weeks ago, which was the first one that Thomas Tuchel was watching. He said he was able to watch it from a from a platform, from a mezzanine level on the first team side or from the academy side. He wasn't able to get quite close because of the restrictions at the training ground right now. But that was a nice moment for Edwin to be able to score two goals in, in that sort of game, knowing that he had an audience that might be impressed. 
he'll come into his own next year, the same as Jimmy Tarion and the Finnish lad we signed and Alexi Heino, the other Finnish lad we signed. They'll be they've they'll, they'll have used the last few months to settle in here and to become more comfortable. And then as things slowly return to normal, you'll see players come out of their shell and get into a groove and really show why Chelsea identified them in other markets to bring them here because they've they've got the quality and they flashed it at little points this season, but it's been that sort mm-hmm. of year that they haven't been able to get into a rhythm. All right. Um, next one. So you've got Joe Haig and Ted Kurd. Look, I'll let you talk about Joe, and I'm excited to jump in on Ted uh, after reading your tweet. So, you know, first one up, Joe produces goals either for really himself does, yeah. or for others. I mean, you look, these numbers are insane, Phil. Yeah, he's got a, a pretty productive record this year and last year. Last year, his season was ended, I think, by a back injury. But he's he's either scoring or he's assisting or he's being frustrated by the woodwork. He played he hit the crossbar twice and the post once against Crystal Palace the other week on his 18th birthday, which must have been a little bit frustrating for him. But he's a really elegant dribbler. His mannerisms remind people of Mason Mount in the way that he moves and strikes the ball. He's 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 a more fluid move than Mason, which isn't any knock on Mason. We know what he's capable of, um, and he's 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 probably too good for under 18 level now but he might be at that point where he's not necessarily able to break into the 23s fold. he will next year through age and he'll be a, a top quality player at that level sooner than, rather than later he hasn't signed a professional contract yet I think it's just through circumstance and I haven't heard any reason to suspect that he won't um, he's he's long been a favourite of mine just because he's so much fun to watch and, uh, and he's one of those modern archetypal players at Chelsea who you move in and around the the attacking areas and he doesn't seem to be affected by it. Those multifunctional players that the academy produce are sometimes maligned as sort of mm-hmm. uh, jack of all trades, master of none, but it sets you up for such a good professional career and you see how many Chelsea graduates are enjoying a successful playing career around Europe and in England and whatever level. We've had a bunch of them make their international debuts over the last week with Rowan Ince playing for Montserrat and Casey Palmer for Jamaica, even Jamal Musiala, 17 years old, gone to Germany, excelled immediately. That, that education that they're getting in the academy is going to serve them well. And Joe's Joe's time will come eventually, but he's been pretty exciting for the 18s for the two years that he's been playing there. The only downside is how long we have to wait for these players <laughs> to get to get more visibility uh, in matches on TV. One player we might have to wait a decade, Phil, to see Ted Kurd. Love the name, first of all. Incredible name, has to be said. <laughs> yeah. He's a goalkeeper for the 18s, but he just turned 15. What? Yeah, there's been a bit of a, a problem not through their own making with the goalkeeping position at under 18 level this year. So they, they had two, uh, they gave scholarships to in the summer, Prince Adagoke and Kalechi Chibwezi. Mm-hmm. Kalechi then upped and left to join Leicester within a couple of months, a move that had been speculated before the scholarship. He signed the scholarship and then the move to Leicester came about and Prince got injured in pre-season, which immediately mm-hmm. leaves you with a shortage of options. They signed uh, Sami Klemsani from Paris who has been waiting? He, he had uh, problems getting international transfer tra- uh, transfer certificates, the clearance to play here. Played for a bit. International duty was meant to be with Morocco for the um, under seventeen African nations that got cancelled, but he's still been playing with them, so he's been absent. And that's left Holsterfield. So Lucas Bergstrom played a few games because he's still age-, age eligible, but was playing splitting time with Carlos Ziga at twenty three level. Lucas is now injured, I believe. They had Jake Askew come back in. Um, on a non-contract basis, he was released at the end of last season. He played a couple of games. Ethan Wadey's played a couple. He had the first half of the season on loan at Dartford. Teddy Sherman Lowe, Sherman Lowe was signed from Burton, was loaned back there in the first half of the season. I believe he's also injured at the minute, which leaves you to delve into your academy ranks. And they don't have an under-16 goalkeeper. So they turned to Ted Kurd and Max Merrick from the under-15s initially in the under-17 cup, which they used for some of the younger players. But then Ted got the nod in some under-18 league matches and has, over the last month, accelerated to the point where he has now played more goalkeeper, more under-18 matches than any other goalkeeper this season. And he's done pretty well with it. There's been one or two shaky moments, as you'd expect, but he only turned 15 in February. 
the number of <laughs> the number of under 15s who've played any minutes in the under 18 Premier League this season could probably be counted on one hand let alone somebody who was 14 for the most part and so we recognize how young he is and we don't want to talk too much about that but when he's pushed into the prominence of this position on merit we just have to give a little nod to what he's doing as being fairly unprecedented at Chelsea and in the under-18 Premier League. And we can watch his development and be encouraged by it. You you don't know when you're going to get a, a break, right, Phil? Like it, yeah. it could be this early on in your career where nine players in front of you are injured and, and you are a scrawny 15-year-old kid making his way through the, the ranks. And you don't know if it's going to come when you're 25, you know, if, if the same thing happens. So it's great to see that he's taking his chances and, and is doing the best that he can. Obviously, not uh, not in the proper age uh, bracket necessarily for, for the competition, but that's really great to see. Yeah, I think, again, I wouldn't be surprised to see him eventually sort of settle back into schoolboy football next season because uh, Prince is fit again and he'll be playing games and there'll be a point where everybody's fit. But he's already shown the ability to play at this level. And once you've done that, you, you've earned the right to to at least stay there and to, to see what comes next. I think the last under-15 to play this regularly at Chelsea was Dujon Sterling, who was something of a man-child mm. by comparison physically at the same age. Uh, it's, it's really impressive that circumstances be damned if you've, if you've been called upon to play at this level in a challenging campaign and you've held up your end of the bargain and some more. You just have a little nod of credit here and there. He looks 15. Well, let's, let's get it. <laughs> I think yeah, they all he, do at that age. All, every bit. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's get into the last question, and we're going to wrap up because we know we've, we've gone long. But You're welcome, too listeners. Much goodness, <laughs> too much goodness to, to talk about here. What would a reasonable goal be for the U18s, Phil, by the end of the season? Obviously, uh, league places are, are kind of very similar to, to the U23s, but what would you say that the official goal is now? I think at this point, it would be to uh, win the Youth Cup back. Uh, since we last spoke, we haven't actually resumed our Youth Cup run because the whole tournament was put on hold for two months and then there was a backlog of fixtures. Chelsea had already played their third round match against Barnsley. They won 8-1 in November. They now face AFC Fylde this Easter weekend. Um, Fylde are a non-league club in the fifth tier of senior football their academy play at an appropriately similar level but they've reached the fourth round um, including they beat Sunderland along the way and Sunderland are a category one academy um, they won't be an easy team to play against no matter how much Chelsea should be favoured to beat them and if Chelsea play their game they will beat them Fylde will make life hard for them they've got some players that have been released from top tier academies like Blackburn and if Chelsea get through that, they are at home to Manchester City or Everton, which means a potential renewal of the Chelsea versus Manchester City rivalry at this level. For the first time, it wouldn't be in a final, which makes it even more interesting. Mm. Chelsea would have home advantage, stands to be at King's Meadow should Chelsea get through, should City get through. A one-off match at home for Chelsea. Um, City defending Youth Cup holders, fantastic squad. Players like Liam De Lapp are still eligible which is terrifying because he's been on a ridiculous tear this season. But at the same time, a lot of these players have already gone head to head twice in the PL2 this season, a pair of two, two draws. One of those barely a couple of weeks ago and Chelsea would fancy themselves to win that. And then if you win that and knock off arguably the best team remaining, you fancy, you'd think, okay, we can go on and win it. The, they'd be away from home in the quarterfinals against one of four other teams. So we're not looking that far ahead yet, but OK, the league campaign is what it is. Use the rest of the league campaign to get minutes into some of the other players who need it. Focus your attention on getting that youth cut back at Chelsea and that would be a good, strong end to the season. Well, that is a, a nice way to kind of round it out considering that we have gone oh. a little bit of time since we've last had you on, Phil. But I think in general, if you don't feel up to date on everything going on with the Lone Army, with the... U23s with the U18s, then you weren't really paying attention Run it back. to the last Start it over. hour plus. Yeah, just rewind a little bit, re-listen, you know, you just got to do it. So thank you, Phil. Obviously, really appreciate you staying on top of the game, staying on top of the academy. Obviously, you have a passion for it. But again, just thank you for coming on and sharing all your knowledge. Thank you for having me on. I'm happy to be here. 
whenever you guys have me and I'm sure it won't be the last time this season or I hope not. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's go ahead and mark that down right now. Nick, yeah. Dan, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, we appreciate it. I think we're all uh, leaving more the wiser after these. And so it's uh, very fun for us to get to put together as well. So anyways, uh, again, more content coming at you this week, Chelsea fans. You need to go to Twitter and thank Phil at Chelsea Youth for sharing all of this knowledge. This is encyclopedic knowledge uh, that he's given us. So uh, go thank him. Anyways, that's going to wrap us up, gentlemen. We appreciate your time, listeners. Let us know who you think is next up-and-coming youth, but that's going to wrap. So until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.